page 48. The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Living, an expert guide to making the life-saving benefits of carbohydrate restriction sustainable and enjoyable. By Jeff S. Volek, Ph.D., Rode and Stephen D. Finney, M.D., Ph.D. Section 2 Perspective Chapter 2 Low-Carbohydrate Lessons from Aboriginal Cultures Putting His Life on the Line 2.2 Stefansson's Inuit Diet Experiment In 1907, a Harvard-trained Canadian anthropologist went into the Canadian Arctic to study the Inuit culture. Whether by chance or design, he spent his first Arctic winter living among the native people of the region without any external food supply. Eight months later, he emerged speaking their language and empowered by the fact that he could live well off the available food of the region. A decade later, Wilhelmer Stefansson left the Arctic, having traveled where no person of European origin had gone before, sometimes for two years without any resupply. Upon his return to a civilization, he wrote copiously about his experience among other people, which is what Inuit means in their language. Unfortunately for Stefansson, the decade between 1915 and 1925 was the era of vitamin discovery at a period in which scientific nutrition hit its stride. Suddenly, we had scientists to tell us what was good for us, replacing grandmothers and cultural wisdom. And scientists now said that all humans needed fruit and vegetables to prevent deficiency diseases like scurvy and beriberi. To the newly minted nutritionists of the 1920s, Stefansson became the proverbial buck wearing a bullseye. To salvage his reputation, he consented, along with an Arctic explorer colleague, to reproduce his Inuit diet under continuous observation in Bellevue Hospital in New York City. After a year, he and his colleague emerged hale and hearty, much to the disappointment of the scientists in charge. What Stefansson's experience, and many other subsequent studies, demonstrated was that dietary carbohydrate is nutritionally superfluous in the context of a well-formulated low-carbohydrate diet. Furthermore, the fact that Aboriginal pemmican not the condiment version loaded with nuts and berries to suit European tastes, provided about 75% of its energy from fat necessarily leads us away from the common misconception that hunters' diets were high in protein. Even the Maasai dietary data provided by Auer and Gilks, if we use modern meat and milk composition data, suggest that they ate about 30% of energy as protein and 70% as fat. Thus we have a range for the proportion of fat in culturally evolved hunting and herding diets from 70% to more than 80% of daily energy intake. There are, of course, extensive published data that dispute these proportions. Analyses of food waste from cave floors and village middens, mounds of discarded household waste, often suggests higher protein intakes leading some to contend that a typical hunter-gatherer rate 40 to 50 percent of his energy as protein, 20 percent as carbohydrates, and only 40 percent or so as fat. However, there are a number of problems with getting good quantitative information by this method. For example, it does not allow us to know which parts of the food were treasured, which discarded, and what parts were fed to the dogs. Among the Inuit when a seal or caribou was killed, the fat was saved for human consumption, or lamp fuel, and the leaner parts were given to the dogs, or any Gullimbalay white guys in the party. Farther to the south, when a spring buffalo, that is, one that had yet to rebuild body fat reserves after the winter, was killed on the Great Plains, the humans ate the tongue, liver, and marrow. These tissues tended to retain their fat content even during periods of privation. The lean meat was either dried, to serve as an emergency food source, or fed to the dogs. This differential partitioning of the kill actually makes a lot of sense, 
as a dog's metabolism is much more tolerant of a high protein intake than is that of a human. But how this was done in a quantitative sense cannot be divined by examining animal bones and seashells and village trash heaps, that is, a middens. So how does one say in Latin beware of garbage dump science? Another limitation of studying these refuse middens is that they only occur adjacent to long-term sites of habitation, such as towns or villages. However, some of the most highly evolved hunting societies were nomadic. If you spend most of your year on the prairie following the migration of the buffalo, you are not going to spend enough time in one site to create a midden. And if you manufacture pemmican at multiple sites along your migration path and return with it every year to a protected winter camp, then nothing you discard in an adjacent dump will inform the modern investigator that much of your diet consisted of fat that was harvested elsewhere before coming into that camp. Similar concerns would apply to shell middens found on the British Columbia coast and elsewhere. These imply a high intake of shellfish protein. However if fresh shellfish harvested in the fall and winter are dipped in oilage and grease transported from a distant spring oilage in camp, that component of the diet would not be appreciated by examining the midden at the winter camp. So here again, standard anthropological techniques used to analyze the composition of aboriginal hunting and fishing diets may mislead us as to the diet's fat content particularly if the investigator comes to the topic with the preconception that such diets were high in protein. Page 52